Between 1907 and the 1920s, most AM radio was sent out using something called an arc transmitter or a pulse and arc. In fact, the tragedy of the sinking of the Titanic in 1912 was partially caused because they didn't use an arc transmitter. But what is an arc transmitter? How was it invented? And how does it work? And what does that have to do with the Titanic? Well, I'll tell you, and along the way, I'll talk about a chemist with a basement full of batteries, a typo, a trailblazing female scientist, her husband's musical grad student, a Dane who made the impossible possible, and a testy and overworked telegraph operator. Ready? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. In the very early 1800s, a handsome English chemist named Humphrey Davy filled a basement with batteries to conduct electrochemical experiments. In 1809, he noticed that if two carbon rods had a large voltage between them, they would create a bright and constant spark. Davy wanted to call it an arch lamp as the light made an arch, but it was quickly called an arc lamp due to a typo. It wasn't until the 1850s that they had generators to use these arc lamps, but it was very popular in the 1860s and 70s. In the 1880s, arc lamps began to be replaced with incandescent light bulbs, although they were still used up to the 1920s for bright lights for film and for searchlights. Now we come to a phenomenal English woman named Hertha Ayrton. She was born to extreme poverty, but with some help from some early suffragettes, managed to get an education in math and science. When she was 30, she took an evening class in electricity and fell in love with the teacher, William Ayrton, and they married the next year. In 1890, William Ayrton started studying the physics of arc lamps. He wondered why they would sputter and hiss. But in 1893, his work was destroyed in a fire. And according to Hertha, he had neither the courage nor the inclination to rewrite his paper. Hertha took over the research and quickly produced 12 papers in the electrician on the physics of arc lamps. She became the first woman to give a talk at the Institution of Electrical Engineers, as well as their first female member. She was also nominated to be a fellow of the Royal Society but was rejected because as a married woman, she was property of her husband and property could not be a fellow. She determined among many other things that the arc lamp hissed because of interaction with oxygen. She also found that if she increased the voltage in certain arcs, the current would decrease. What was going on? Hertha's husband, William, became convinced from Hertha's graph that the arc must have a negative resistance. This created a huge controversy. William Ayrton said, quote, had we lived in the Middle Ages, we should undoubtedly had been burned in the solid carbon arc. Now, William Ayrton had a graduate student named William Duddle. Duddle also began to study arc lamps. He felt that Hertha had left him a window to study what happens to arc lamps when you change the current more or less rapidly. While playing with changing the current across the lamp, he added a capacitor, also called a condenser, next to an arc lamp powered by a battery. To his surprise, the system, which was powered by direct current, made alternating current and rang musically. Duddle straightened the lead wires and the note disappeared. But if he had the wires go through a coil, the sound was greatly magnified. What was going on? Duddle quickly figured out that the coil and the capacitor oscillated and the arc lamp first started the oscillation and amplified the oscillation. Let me explain. A capacitor is simply an object with two conducting surfaces that are separated by an insulator. This can store charges on its surface. If those charges are discharged through a coil, then the changing field in the coil will create more charges to flow, causing the capacitor to be charged in the opposite direction. This will then cause the capacitor to discharge the other way. Therefore, if you discharge a capacitor through a coil, it will create an oscillating wave. However, the wave will usually die down due to friction. Duddle realized that the arc played two roles. First, the arc helped create the oscillating wave in the first place. This happened because when you first connect the battery, the battery would charge up the capacitor until it reached a certain voltage, 
and then the electricity could jump over the arc. When the current jumped over the arc, it also discharged the capacitor through coil, creating the alternating current. Secondly, the alternating current from a capacitor in a coil is kept from dying out by the arc with its negative resistance, which converts some of the energy from the battery to the alternating current to keep it ringing. Duddle had created a smooth AC generator with no moving parts, and he'd also made one of the first, if not the first, electric resonant circuits. This is the backbone of almost all radio. However, Duddle was convinced that it wouldn't work at a higher frequency than about 10,000 waves per second, which is way lower than radio waves. As a side note, Duddle knew he could change the musical note that his machine played by changing the length of the coil or changing the size of the capacitor. He actually adjusted the connection to the coil to make the lamp play, quote, a distinct and not unmusical rendition of God Save the Queen. A Danish scientist named Valdemar Poulsen heard about Duddle's singing arc lamp, and he thought it would be perfect for making a device that would sing at radio frequencies. Poulsen said that the radio waves produced before were like the sound waves produced by a pistol shot, while his wave were like the waves of sound produced by a tuning fork. How did Poulsen succeed where Duddle failed? Well, he started with Hertha Ayrton's contention that the hissing of the arc lamp had to do with reactions with oxygen in the air. Poulsen thus put his lamp near a machine called a spirit vapor that emitted hydrogen gas. This ate up the oxygen, which made the signal more constant which caused the amplifier to work better, especially at higher frequencies. Poulsen also found that if you made the oscillation too fast, sometimes the capacitor would spark and glow. He attempted to solve this problem by adding a magnet or an electromagnet in all sorts of orientations, and found that if he placed a magnetic field over the gap in the arc lamp, he could successfully create very high frequencies. The magnetic field would stop most of the direct current from flowing between the carbon rods but would not stop the high frequency alternating current. Just these two things, a magnet and a vapor lamp, would create a crude carbon arc lamp transmitter that would make basically constant radio frequencies. Poulsen refined it further though. He found that a copper carbon arc worked better than a carbon carbon arc, although the copper had to be kept cool with water. Finally, he found that if he rotated the carbon electrode, it would help keep the signal steady. Because this machine would send radio signals at basically a constant frequency, you could send several signals at the same time at different frequencies. Also, smooth radio waves are required for transmitting sound wirelessly. Poulsen thought his arc transmitter could be, quote, used in an electric generator for wireless telegraphy and telephony. And he was right. Unfortunately, Guillermo Marconi was not interested in a new technology, especially one he did not have exclusive patents for. This was tragically played out in 1912, when the SS Titanic was fitted with Marconi's old-fashioned shotgun spark gap transmitters that could only send one message at a time. When the Titanic passed the point where it could wirelessly communicate with the US, the sole wireless operator was overwhelmed with messages to and from the wealthy passengers. We'll be up all bloody night on this lot. Sorry. You're joking. At the same time, the SS Californian stopped 20 miles away due to an ice field and sent the Titanic a message that said, Say, old man, we are surrounded by ice and stopped. However, the Titanic operator probably didn't hear what the Californian operator had to say, as he was blown away by the volume of the nearby ship. Bloody hell! Irritated, the overworked Titanic operator replied, Shut up, shut up, shut up! I'm busy, I'm working! The operator of the Californian, offended, sent a blast of wireless noise, and then at 11.35, turned off his machine and went to bed. Well, that's it for me. I'm shutting down. Ten minutes later, the Titanic hit an iceberg. The officers on the Californian misunderstood when they saw the Titanic's flares of distress and stood by as the Titanic sank. If they had used arc transmitters, 
they could have had several operators sending several signals at different frequencies, and they might not have been so overworked and overwhelmed. Also, like today, they could have had a separate signal just reserved for warnings and distress signals. Marconi eventually learned his mistake, and by 1922, 80% of all commercial wireless signals were from ARC transmitters. Back in 1904, Polson demonstrated his transmitter at a conference in St. Louis. One person who was particularly interested in using it to send sound wirelessly was the self-described father of radio, Lee DeForest. DeForest knew that his arch rival, Reginald Fesedon, had been sending sound wirelessly since 1900 and was working on an alternator to make smooth, continuous radio waves. However, the alternator, which was built in 1906, was a feat of engineering, nearly impossible to copy. The crude Polson arc, however, was far easier to make at home. How this con artist stole his way into radio history is next time on The Secret History of Electricity. Electricity, 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 electricity. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to give it a nice thumbs up. If you're interested in Hertha Ayrton, I am. She's fascinating. I made a separate video about her and I'll put a link at the end. Okay, have a nice day.